Welcome back to this walkthrough tour of the National Museum of the United States Air Force here in Dayton, Ohio. In this episode, we'll do a cursory look at building number four, the Research and Development Gallery, and then in the next video, building number three, the Cold War Collection. I've been here at the museum most of the day and still have a lot more to go. There is no way one can stroll through this amazing collection of aircraft in a single day. But I'll do what I can to show you some of the highlights. I'm going to start with this Lockheed C-141 Starlifter C model which was one of the Air Force's first major jet-powered transports. The first C-141 flew in December 1963. There's a great look up the loading ramps into the cargo bay. This C model had its fuselage stretched over 20 feet and its wing beefed up, and when fully loaded, it weighed in at 323,000 pounds. You could fit 155 fully equipped paratroopers in here, or if not paratroopers, more than 68,000 pounds of cargo. A look up through the bulkhead onto the flight deck. And then turn around aft where you're greeted by this huge cargo bay. This aircraft is called the Hanoi Taxi because it brought the very first American Vietnam POWs out of Vietnam after the war had ended. This here looks like an SR-71, but it's not. It's a YF-12A, a supersonic combat interceptor and a definite cousin of the SR-71. Only three of these were made, and the project never made it past the flight testing phase before it was canceled. This is the only one of the three to survive, as the other two were lost in crashes. This is the Avro Aerocar, and very likely the source of many a flying saucer sighting back in the 1950s. Actually, that's very unlikely. This was more of a ground effect craft and didn't get more than a few feet off the ground. So it really wasn't something that you would see high in the air. Like many early aviation ideas, it really never panned out and the program was canceled. This cartoonish looking thing is called the Goblin. What a fantastic name! The idea behind this little bugger was that it would be carried inside of a bomber, and if attacked, it could be lowered and released to engage enemy fighters. It would then return to be captured using the hookup on top and brought back aboard the mothership sounded good, but this never made it beyond testing. The biggest aircraft in the gallery is this Valkyrie XB-70. She's a monster, dwarfing everything else in the building. First flown in the 1960s, she was designed as a supersonic long-range high-altitude bomber, capable of a scorching Mach 3. Each one of those six GE engines produced 30,000 pounds of thrust. That's 90 tons of force pushing this bird forward. But anti-aircraft and ICBM missiles made this aircraft obsolete before testing was even complete. Tucked under the Valkyrie's wing is this X-1B, strictly an experimental aircraft. This is from the 1950s and was used to help to explore supersonic and hypersonic flight, things like how to control the aircraft and manage the effects of aerodynamic heating. Here's another strictly experimental aircraft, but probably much better known than the X-1B, the X-15, an iconic 1960s era hypersonic test aircraft. This aircraft took pilots to the very boundary of space. I don't think it was until they started putting people on the top of rockets that we would go higher. Now over to some spacecraft. This is a Mercury program capsule, America's first manned rocket program. Let's look inside. Pretty cramped looking. Here 
Here's a Gemini capsule. It says this Gemini capsule was part of a top secret reconnaissance program for the U.S. Air Force. It had a laboratory module behind the capsule that could be entered once in orbit, which I guess was used for developing film. Missions were two to four weeks in duration, then the capsule would bring the crew back to Earth. I've never heard about this program, which I guess is not too surprising since it never became a reality as the program was canceled. Bigger than the Mercury capsule, the crew sat side by side, but it still was a pretty tight fit. Here's the right side seat. Some of these Gemini capsules had the ability to be maneuvered. While you were not much more than a rider inside a Mercury capsule. And here's an Apollo capsule. This one being from Apollo 15, which was the fourth time the Apollo program put astronauts on the moon. And of course, the capsule itself never landed on the moon. It remained in orbit and waited for the lunar lander to return from the surface. And then it brought the three crew members safely back to Earth. It's now on to the Cold War Gallery, but that will be in the next video. Until then, remember, life is a journey. Enjoy the ride, and thanks for watching.